Well, last week, Preston brought a powerful message on what this entire series is about, and that's this idea to be right with God. We must be right with man. And his message is so powerful, many people during the service actually got up and made things right with their loved ones around the community or even from a, on a phone. It was powerful. And of course, Christian shared at the end how he wanted to make things right with the entire church. And he stood forward and he, he asked for forgiveness. I'm telling you, God is powerful. God is moving in the lives of our church. And I want you to know something. Oftentimes we forget that our relationship with God is impacted by the way in which we treat one another. And so today we're going to look at this idea of what does it look like as it pertains to anger? I mean, nobody really likes to talk about this topic much. I mean, anger is one of those things we want to pretend that it's just really not a big deal. Men, do you remember the first time you got angry? Ladies, do you remember the first time you really got angry? I mean, let's just take a minute. It might not take you very long. Not the last time, okay? The first time you got really angry. Can you remember that moment? Can you remember? Oh, I'm going to ask you if you had these feelings. Did words of affirmation just come right to your tongue? Were the words that came all about lifting up and encouraging and enlightenment and correction and instruction, I mean, they were really wholesome words that came to your mind? Or did you think immediately of destruction, humiliation, provocation, words of death? Maybe even you found yourself acting out in force. Maybe you even struck someone. Maybe, maybe you even murdered somebody. Truthfully, maybe you got so angry, you found yourself wanting to murder someone or take their life or get vengeance on them. I don't know about you, but anger is one of those things. I remember the very first time that I really, really, really got angry. Now, I, I, I'm sure there were other times, but this one just stands out in my mind. I was... I had just received this brand new BB gun. Now in Seldovia, we weren't the smartest people in all the world, okay? So us boys, there was probably six or seven of us in the town that were kind of in the same age. And we loved the Daisy BB gun because it was one cock. And if you wore glasses, you could play cowboys and Indians with it. And you could shoot each other. And it, you know, it, yeah, it stung a little bit, but it was fun. Well, unfortunately... Daisy got a little better, and they came out with this air-cocked BB gun. And my mom bought me one. It was so cool. You could just keep pumping it up and pumping it up and pumping it up. And let me tell you, you do not want to get shot with that. So the guys would be upset with me, and they said, hey, listen, you can only pump one time, or you can't use that gun. Now, you guys are all saying, are you crazy? Yes, we were. Absolutely crazy. We were crazy. But I found that this BB gun was so powerful. I loved it. I, I, I shot all kinds of things with this BB gun. And one time I was playing with it, and my sister's boyfriend came, and I said, listen, I'm telling you, this BB gun is so impressive. I think I can shoot through a five-gallon can. It's impressive. He says, there is no way that thing is not that strong. We start wrestling over the gun. It's never good. I'd already pumped it about 10 times, which was the limit. And we're wrestling back and forth. He's like, give me the gun. He was a teenager. You know, teenagers, jerks. No, just joke. <laughs> so he was fighting it over, and all of a sudden, bam! And I go, you shot me! He says, I did not. I said, you shot me in the foot. I'm telling you. He said, show me. I pull my foot boot off, and I'm like, there's no blood. But, but I definitely got shot. My foot is just hurting so incredibly bad. I run inside and I tell my mom, he shot me. I won't tell you his name. He shot me. He shot me. He shot me. She says, show me. I show her my, uh, my toe and she goes, he didn't shoot you. I'm telling you, mom, it, he shot me. I'm so angry. I'm in pain. I cannot bear one moment. And I'm thinking to myself, there's just no way. He shot me right in the foot. Well, I'm in pain all night long and I'm just angry. I am angry. I'm thinking about how I can shoot this guy, how I can go to his house. I mean, I am angry, angry. I am so angry. I am overwhelmed with anger. The next day, I'm like, Mom, he shot me in the foot. My foot is dying. She says, fine, we'll go to the doctor. Well, in Seldovia, you don't have much of a doctor. So we go to the doctor, and he says, I can't tell. There's a little bump here, but it doesn't look like much. But we'll take an x-ray so he'll feel good. <laughs> By the way, I have like a filing cabinet of doctor visits in Seldovia. <laughs> and sure enough, he takes this x-ray, 
Guess what? There's a BB in my foot. <laughs> I cannot explain it, why it did not bleed. But sure enough, the BB had lodged itself between my knuckle. It, and it was inside there. And he goes, well, how about that? I said, yeah, how about that? This dude shot me. He shot me. So after four hours surgery and digging around in my foot, finally, blink, there comes the BB out. I'm telling you, I've never faced this kind of anger before. I am frustrated with my mom. I am frustrated with him. I am upset that nobody would listen to me. I am angry. I am consumed with anger. I find myself angry, angry, angry. Do you remember your time of being angry? Was it something like that? You're thinking, well, you were justified to be angry. Was I? I probably was a little bit. But afterwards, it just started to consume my mind. The anger that I had towards this guy doing this to me, I got, had to sit in bed for a week. The only positive thing that came out of that training was that I learned how to whistle with my fingers. My mom could really do it loud. She could whistle and, not, and you could hear her in the whole town. I'll do it right now, but I will deafen the microphone and you guys because I can whistle pretty loud. That's the only positive that came out of it. I found myself just so angry. My anger, though, did, didn't do some things. It, it didn't help me heal very quickly. It, it didn't help me get any better. It didn't change my circumstance. It didn't make me feel any better. Matter of fact, it just absolutely consumed me. It consumed me for a period of time, a short period of time, praise God. But what did your anger do to you? That, that moment when you found yourself so angry, maybe you were really hurt by somebody. Maybe it was really something bad. It was much worse than simply getting shot in the foot. Maybe it was horrible. What is it about our anger? It takes us to places where we don't want to be. And the question that I have for you today is, are you still living in that spot where anger has taught you and brought you? You see, anger reveals our deepest parts of our hearts. And that, my friend, is what God cares about. God cares about your heart. He doesn't care that you pretend like you have it all together. He doesn't care if you want to justify your anger. He doesn't care how much we say it doesn't affect our relationship with him. He knows better. Our anger impacts every part of us. And that is exactly why he wants us to know that being right with one another, listen, helps us display his kingdom heart. The way we handle anger helps the world see that we are followers of Christ. So how does Jesus in this passage, if you have your Bibles, let's open them up, Matthew chapter 5, we are in verse 20. How does Jesus introduce this idea, this thought about anger, this idea of being right with man and right with God, dealing with this topic of anger, which is so hard to talk about? He does some crazy conversation right here in the beginning. This is what he says in verse 20. He says, listen, to be right with God is to be right with man. And let me just explain to you how hard it is. For I tell you, unless you are right, your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. So right off the bat, Jesus is like, let me just tell you something about how this relationship with me is going to work. Unless you're more righteous than righteous than the most righteous person you know in that culture in that time, you will not enter the kingdom of God. What? Well, I guess I don't have a chance. I'm sure you're thinking the, possibly the same thing, but then he proceeds to talk about anger. He says in verse 21, have you, you have heard that it was said of days of old that you shall not murder, and whosoever murders shall be liable of the judgment. He starts about this concept and says, listen, you've heard that it's not right to murder someone. And if you do, you're going to be liable to the judgment. What was, what was the command? What was this, the concept? Well, it was found in Exodus 20, verse 13, one of the Ten Commandments, number six in the list. You shall not commit a murder. Well, what was the judgment of this murder when we committed murder? When we committed somebody or killed somebody for uh, undue cause, what happened? Well, it's found in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. It says this, whoever sheds the blood of man... By, man's, by man shall his blood be shed. Whoa. And God, for God has made man in his own image. In other words, hey, if you take the life of a person, the only ultimate fair payment is for you to give your life in replace of his, to give up your life. Because why? Because every man is created in the image of God. What a bold statement. 
Anyone who kills with unjust anger owes his own life payment in full. Now that seems to money reasonable. At this time, it did mean it was reasonable. Do you realize in this culture, people would have heard that and said, yeah, that's great. Totally problem. No problem at all. Somebody kills somebody, absolutely, their life should be taken. That's the way it is. That was the society that he grew up in. Not only that, listen to me. That was what the entire world's position was on murder. If you killed someone with unjust cause, your life would be taken, and it was throughout society. Why? Because the punishment was actually, the command was actually given to Noah when he got off the ark. When he got off the ark, Noah was told, hey, listen, this is one of the first rules. You don't take the life of another person. You're going to find that through the oldest recorded history, through all, all civilizations, that this is truth. This is truth. This is the payment. But what's sad is this. What's sad about this whole argument that Jesus is making, he's not making any argument about committing murder. He, he goes and makes a new law. He doesn't abolish the old law. He makes this new law, this idea that this murder is not just about the physical taking on of life. And I think that's where most Christians, most people struggle. No, he makes it even more impossible for us to keep this law. I mean, he goes from, you shouldn't commit murder. And some of you are in here and say, I don't do that. I would never do that. I'm not going to do that. I never get that angry. And then he just kicks it up a notch. He says, well, I know that's probably the case, but let's just say this. Verse 22, but I say to you, this is Jesus, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable of the same judgment. Well, we're all probably guilty of that. What? And then he doesn't, in, in, in there, whosoever insults his brother will be liable of, to the council. And whosoever says, you fool, call somebody a name, yeah, you idiot, will be liable of hellfire. No, you're not even going to give up your life. You're going to spend eternity in hell. What? I don't like that verse. If I'm angry without cause, if I hurl insults at someone, if I call people names, it's the same as murdering someone. I'm afraid that question, answer to that question is yes. That's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is revealing what it is meant to be right with him. He is revealing something that we can't comprehend. It requires more than just the simplicity of obeying the law. It requires our hearts and our consciences Consciousness to be pure before him in every area of life. Oh my goodness, friend. You're probably thinking, Pastor Ron, that is impossible. And I'm here to tell you, the answer to that is that is true. It is impossible. That was Christ's point. It is impossible for us to live a life never getting angry, never de demeaning some other person, never having a heart against someone. That was the entire point. Apart from Christ, all people come up short. That's what he's trying to convey. To the non-believer, he's saying, listen, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And if you cannot do this, if you cannot live this way better than the Pharisees, you don't have any place in the kingdom of heaven. You say, man, that doesn't seem realistic. No, it's even worse than that. Think about this. No, from Mother Teresa to Mahatma Gandhi, I don't care how good you are. I don't care how many good works you do. I don't care how you transform the world with your goodness. It is not going to be good enough to enter the kingdom of heaven. You cannot get there. Why? Because I promise you, you cannot obey this command 100%. If you are here and you are not a follower of Jesus, I want to explain something to you. I want you to know that although you are a sinner like myself who have had a problem with anger his whole life, you can be forgiven for this sin. Jesus' point is not to, to say that this is impossible to overcome. What he's saying is this, without him, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You cannot have a kingdom heart. You will struggle with this forever. He places this idea of the perfect life before us. He was the one who lived a perfect, sinless life, and without him, you cannot overcome this simple concept of anger. You can't do it. It's impossible. And so if you're unsaved here, I want you to know something. You 
are guilty. We in this room, everyone is guilty of this sin. And the only way to live forgiven, the only way to not face this judgment is to give your life to Christ. The only way for you to enter eternal life and not be cast into hell is to realize that Christ is the only way to be forgiven, the only way to have a life reconciled to God. And so I would encourage you, if you're here, to consider that truth, that you must be reconciled to God. I want to challenge you to consider that as we talk about this idea of anger. But if you're a Christian in the house, if you're a Christ follower, I want you to know something. Although we have been forgiven of our sin because it is impossible for us to not live, per, uh, live a perfect life in the realm of anger, God does call us to something incredibly great. God does say that once you become a Christian, once you give your life to Christ, he indwells you. He grants you the Holy Spirit. He gives you and I the power to overcome our sin of anger. And I want to talk to you about the, today about the importance of understanding and refraining from anger. I think that one of the reasons why this is great that it falls on Father's Day is because most people would say that men are the ones who struggle the most with anger. Now, some ladies in the house, you know, there's an exception. Some of you guys got some hot tempers. But for the most part, men are the ones, they are the ones who find themselves acting out in anger. And I want you to understand something, that anger has no place in the kingdom of heart. Let me say that again, Christians in the house, church. Anger has no place in our hearts. If you're a believer here today, anger has no place in your heart. You have to live differently. Notice Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, it says this, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit hmm, of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. So today, we're going to take the remaining part of our time and we're going to look at some things. We're going to look at three ways in which anger distracts us, destroys our lives. First, we must recognize that the anger never, listen, anger never leads you and I to a place where we want to go. Let me say that again. Anger never leads you and I to a place where we want to go. At the end of our fit of anger, it's never where we wanted to be. It did not solve any problems. It distracts us, it destroys us, and it deceives us. Those three areas, distracts, destroys, and deceives. Notice the first thing is this, anger distracts us from what is best. Let me just tell you men in this house, anger distracts you from what is best. Ladies, let me just tell you, anger distracts you from what is best for your life. James 1.19 says this, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For anger, listen to me, of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Jesus knew this. Anger does not produce the righteousness of God. In other words, anger is not going to produce what you're thinking you want as a believer in Christ. It's not going to get you there. Anger distract us, distracts us from our calling. I'm going to tell a little story. Might offend some, but I hope it doesn't. This last year, I've had to deal with some people that are making some very interesting comments about me on social media. Don't you love social media? It's a place of heaven. It's where everybody can say whatever you, they want. And what I'm finding is this, that if you defend yourself, you're looked at as a hypocrite. Like, hey, just let them vent. They need to vent about these things. I want you to know something. That makes me joyous. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. That makes me angry. I get so upset because I'm like, listen, they're not telling the truth. I want to speak the truth. And you know what I was told? They don't care about the truth. They just want to vent. They just want to destroy someone's life. I said, I don't like that. I want to be forgiven. I want to call. I want to make things right. I want to reconcile. I don't like tension between us. I was told that. And they said, nah, they don't want that. And so what did I do? I got angrier. I was told that the truth did not matter. As a matter of fact, if you started to defend yourself, you would actually make the situation worse. If you told the truth. And so what did I do? I got angrier. 
I found myself wanting to forgive or be restored, and I was told they didn't want forgiveness or restoration. I was told that what mattered was their reality, not, not the truth, not the reality at all, and I found myself getting angrier and angrier. I found myself at the end of this day questioning some things. I, I started asking myself, have I just been wasting the last 30 years of my life? I mean, I've devoted myself to helping these people who are making, saying in my, in my life that I, I, I'm a horrible person. And yet in my mind, I'm thinking, listen, I've paid for their school to go to ACS. I've spent time and hours and energy coaching and going through scripture with them. And yet it all didn't matter. The truth didn't matter. And so I started questioning, well, is it worth it? And I'm sure when you get angry, sometimes you're thinking, is it worth it? I found myself here. Is it worth it? Is it worth it for me to invest in the lives of those who are less fortunate? I saw myself as less fortunate. That's why you're going to find me all the time pointing our church to helping the less fortunate because I was that guy. And I thought, is it worth it? Is it worth it to help someone and then get treated poorly? And I thought about Christ and I thought, I guess uh, it's, uh, it's probably true. Jesus came, he helped people, and yet they crucified him. It struggles. It was a struggle. It was a struggle with me. And then all of a sudden I asked myself this question. Hmm. Sometimes I found myself realizing that I am pretty slow to learn. Man, I don't know about you, but I find myself slow to learn. I found myself in a place where I shouldn't be. I, I, I say things that I shouldn't do. I, I, I fail to apologize for statements that I make. And so I just have to tell myself, I, I, I'm not the, the bad person I thought I was. I had to tell myself, I, I have a heart for good people. I, I'm finding myself so consumed with this situation that I'm, I'm distracted from what God has truly called me to be. Men, when you find yourself angry, ladies, when you find yourself angry, I want you to understand something. You're being distracted from what God has called you to be, and that is to love God and to love others. And so all that stuff and that garbage that happened on social media and continues to happen all the time whenever somebody has something to say, I have to remind myself that I'm called to something greater, and that is to love God and love people. It doesn't matter what anybody says, that is what our calling is. My question for you is, what happens when you lose focus and are distracted by your anger? Does your mission suffer? Does your family suffer? Does your purpose suffer? Here's a thought. Everyone who doesn't receive God's love from you because you are too busy being angry suffers. Suffers. In other words, God has called you to be salt and light. God has called you to be different. The moment I was distracted by what someone else had to say about me, I found myself in a, in a frustrating place. I found myself not spending my time thinking and praying and engaging in the lives of others. And I'm here to say, I believe that's the truth for most Christians in the house who are dealing with anger. You find yourself so consumed, so wanting justice, that you forget that God has called you to something greater. You've been distracted. So instead of being angry, I decided to do what the Bible says. Isn't that amazing? It's always good. I started praying for them. I didn't want to get back at them any longer. And you want to know what I found? I found myself at peace because God had called me to something greater. I wasn't perfect. Great thing is that God's not looking for perfect people. God's not looking for you to be a perfect person God is looking for you to be repentant, self-identified sinner willing to forgive yourself and forgive others. That is our mission for reconciliation. That's how communities can come together. That's how churches come together. If we're just going to live angry with the purpose of destroying one another, nothing good happens. It's all about distraction. Distraction. Jesus said it this way. It's pretty interesting. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They know not what they do. Forgiveness is the act of faith in God who can what? Do whatever you cannot do on your own. You cannot live in such a way that God works in your life when you're angry. You'll find yourself completely distracted. 
completely distracted. And if we're not careful, we can too justify our anger and become tools of what I call Satan. When we find ourselves living in distraction, we're going to find ourselves living where Satan is actually controlling our lives. Satan is pulling the strings and we are not using what God has called us to do. I want you to understand something, men and women who are dealing with anger. Anger is distracting you from what God has for you. But not only that, anger destroys your life and the lives of others. Do you know that anger destroys things? It destroys lives. If you haven't realized that, you need to hang out with me a little bit. This weekend, I went out four-wheeling. I just got this illustration. It was wonderful. I was out with the interns and with some people that were in town, and we went four-wheeling. I love going four-wheeling. I finally got all of my four-wheelers, except for the one that was stolen, by the way. If you still know where that's at, I'd like it back. But we went out riding with the older four-wheelers since I couldn't sell them because I had lost the other one. And so we went out riding, and we're driving along, and, and one of the four-wheelers breaks down that just came out of the shop. And what do you think I was excited about joyous things? I'm so glad that there's 20 of us out here and we're all working on a four-wheeler. Sure enough, mechanics fought, forgot to do, put something back together and it was overheating and I was, you know, frustrated a little bit putting it back together. And I thought to myself, I'm going to, I'm just going to drive this thing one more time. I think I fixed it, but I'm kind of upset. And I'm like, how dare them? A bunch of, hmm. So I jump on the, I'm like, you, well, if you know me, I have a lead foot. So I'm like, I am going to just, I'm taking this thing out. So I stomp on the throttle as fast as I can. I go about 10 feet. <laughs> Boom. The entire thing blows up into a thousand pieces. Anger destroys things. Anger destroys things. Now, the people with, that were with me, they thought, man, you handled that so cool because I got out of the car and I said, Amir, it's a good thing you weren't driving because I'd probably be angry with you, but it's hard to be angry with myself. <laughs> Anger destroys things. Anger destroys lives. It destroys toys. It destroys people around us. Listen, men, I want you to understand some. How many times, how many Christian homes must be destroyed before we get our anger under control? How many homes must be destroyed until we get our anger under control? It's time for us to stop justifying our anger and lead our homes. Stop venting your frustration on your wife and your children. Hold yourself accountable for your bad decisions, i.e., my bad decision. I blew that motor up all on my own. Are you willing to do that? To love, serve, lead, grow, live, serve? Be a man who is not known for his anger, but his humble leadership. Why should we do this, church? Why should we do this, men? Why is this kingdom heart so important? Why should we live this way? Psalms 37, 8 says this. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. This is the ugly one. It tends only to evil. The only good thing that happens out of anger, it, 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 nothing. Nothing. It tends only to evil. It pursues us to do things and say things and go places we never thought we would. But anger destroys you and those around you. So it distracts us. It destroys us. It also deceives us. Deceives us. Do you realize some of you are so deceived by your anger? I find myself sometimes deceived by anger. I can't see clearly. I'm blind to the truth. I find myself struggling. And I read this story, and I thought this was a great summary of how anger can consume and deceive our minds. There was a woman who exploded in rage when her, the car in front of her did not move fast enough to make it through the yellow light. Have you been there? Like, you're in a hurry, and they're like petering along. Light turns yellow forever, and you're like, we could make it. No. She was in a hurry. This woman, so she did what was proper. She exploded. Now, I'm sure none of you have ever done that. She started to swear. She shouted at the car. She honked. She raised the middle finger. Mm, you're like, oh, my. You know that's, give me a break. Her anger had deceived her into thinking that her response was justified, necessary, and applicable. 
right? I mean, we feel like this is, this is the proper response. Don't you know I'm in a hurry? However, on her car was the fish symbol. And her license plate was framed with the word peace. Her bumper sticker said, Jesus loves you. Hmm. That's why some of you don't like stuff on your car. That's what it is. You're like, I, I ain't putting that on my car. I don't, I don't want to be this illustration. That's a bad answer, by the way. Bad answer. A cop happened to be behind her and pulled her over, asking for her credentials, which she nervously handed over. And after a long time, the officer strutted back to the car and told her she could finally go with no ticket or anything. And the woman, frustrated because she was even more late. I mean, you know how it is when you're speeding because you're late and then you get pulled over and you're later. That's why police say don't speed, doesn't help you. She asked him, why was I pulled over? Why in the world was I pulled over? And the, the officer says this. It's just that I thought that after I saw what you had done and heard what you said, I thought this car must be stolen. <laughs> hmm. Listen, anger deceives us. Anger deceives us. It fools us. It tricks us. Anger deceives us about our past. Anger deceives us about our future. Anger deceives us about what is really, really, really important. Anger deceives us about our relationships. It deceives us about our sin. Church, anger is not our friend. So what are our weapons? What are our weapons? How can we overcome this anger? What is it that we must know from this distraction, this deceiving, and this destroying? We must stop being selfish. We must stop being selfish. So I created an acronym about selfish, the words in selfish. What does it mean? What's it all about? What is the S in selfish? What does it stand for? Well, we must remember this. Speech must, con we must control our speech. Now you say that's easier said than done, is it? It's easy to control our speech unless we're in front of our boss or in front of somebody who's important or somebody we want something from. The truth is this, we can control our speech. Ephesians 4.29 says this, let no corrupt com communication come out of your mouth, but only such is good for building up as it fits for the occasion, that it may be give grace to those who hear it. God has called us, if you have a kingdom heart, you need to understand that your speech matters. My speech matters. That's why when I was out and I blew that entire thing up yesterday with all the interns, or the day before yesterday, I didn't say a word except, mm, inside I was... Speech matters. E, enemy. We must know who the true enemy is. Church, listen to this. You must know who the true enemy is. Ephesians 4, 26, be angry and do not sin. Let not the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to who? The devil. Your anger is being used by the devil. You're giving him an opportunity into your life in and into the life of the one you're angry with. You're not being reconciled. And so Satan has power over you. L is lead. We must lead for something greater than ourselves. For us to understand anger, we must understand that we are leaders. We are the world changers. We, you and I, we are salt and light. There's nobody else with that responsibility. We as Christians are salt and light. So it says this in Proverbs 16, 32, whosoever is slow to anger, this is powerful, is better than the mighty. He who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. In other words, it doesn't matter about all the accomplishments you do in the world. It doesn't matter who you conquer and what you overcome. If you cannot control your anger, you are not that great. The greatest of us, all of us as believers, are ones who learn to control their anger. They are slow to it. F stands for friends. We must choose our friends wisely, men. 
We must choose our friends wisely. Where do we get these habits to explode? We might have gotten them from our father. We might have gotten them from our friends. Proverbs 22, 24 says this, make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man. Stop hanging around angry people. It is impacting your life, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in his snares. How do we overcome anger? I, we must recognize I am the problem. I am the problem. It's my sinful passion. It's not because someone did something. It's not because the person broke the four-wheeler that reflects my anger or did it wrong or whatever. It's my response. What comes out of me is me. I'm the one who's angry. I'm the one who has the control. I am the problem. I hope that every one of you will stop making the excuses. It's someone else. Stop pointing your finger at other people when you get angry and just point it right at yourself. You do not have to respond that way. James 4.1 says this, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not your passions that are at war within you? It's your own battle. You're angry because you're impatient or you wanted something else or I would be angry because I was embarrassed that we couldn't go out riding or whatever the answer is. Now I was angry. Are you angry? Do you understand why you have anger? Do you understand why you're frustrated? Is it about your ego? It's about yourself. S stands for sense. We must pursue God's a good sense and overlook an offense. We must, must pursue good sense and overlook an offense. Proverbs 19.11 says this, good sense. Good sense makes one slow to anger. Listen, good sense. We've lost it. And it is to, the, to his glory to overlook an offense. Good sense helps us overlook an offense. Good sense helps us overlook an offense. How many times have you overlooked an offense? When was the last time somebody did something really harsh to you and you chose to overlook it? Can you remember that moment? I'm afraid not many of us can because that's not in our vocabulary because we don't understand what anger does to us. It destroys us, distracts us, deceives us. Hmm, heart, H. We must protect our heart, lastly. Church, we have to protect our hearts. Ecclesiastes 7, 9 says this, be quick in your spirit to become, do not be quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of really wise people. Nope. Anger lodges in fools. Now, I didn't say that, but define yourself now. Are you a wise man, a wise woman, or are you a fool? Has anger lodged itself in your heart? Is it impacting your ability to do what God has called you to do? Are you missing the point that to be right with man or to be right with God, you must be right with man? Do you understand that? My challenge today is this. Are you controlling your anger? Are you being distracted, deceived, and are you destroying your life? Are you acting selfishly? Or do you desire to have a kingdom heart? Do you desire to have a kingdom heart? My desire is to have a kingdom heart. And I want you to know that I have a sin problem. And occasionally, I get angry. But my heart is to not do that. And I know that I can overcome that when I live by the Spirit and not in the flesh. But it is such a battle between the flesh and the Spirit in my soul, and it's such a battle in your soul. And guess what? We have no excuse. We cannot blame anyone else. We must die to self and be Spirit-led so that we can be the example that the world needs to see. It needs to see a church that doesn't live in anger. It needs to be a church that lives differently, transformed by the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. And so today, my prayer for you, men on Father's Day, change your heart. Change your heart. Change your view on the impact that anger is making in your life. Decide today to live differently. It will transform your future, I promise you. Hey everybody, Pastor Ron here. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Here at ABT, we make a big deal about following Jesus. Make sure that you subscribe and hit our notification bell so that you don't miss any of our upcoming video content. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry, please click donate now. Thanks for watching.